Hi, my name is Nandita Jairaj and I'm here today with Ahana Ganguly, who is a chemistry professor here at Azim Premji University. We're here today to talk about the Nobel Prize in Chemistry that was given out just a few weeks ago. The 2024 Nobel Prize in Chemistry was given to David Baker for the computational protein design and also John Jumper and Demis Hassabis for protein structure prediction. Uh, so, Hannah, I think it's safe to say that most of us know now what proteins are. We know that we need them in our diet. We also know that they're basically required for the function of any living organism. And some of us might even remember from school that proteins are made of chains of amino acids. And, um, you know, sometimes these chains don't just stay as straight lines, but there are some interesting things happening there. So I want to ask you about protein folding. What exactly is protein folding and why is it so important? Yeah, so uh, it's basically the interesting things that are happening that you were referring to, right? So every protein um, you may remember from school is a sequence of amino acids, right? And there are basically maybe about 20 different amino acids that our body uses to make these proteins or any biological system uses to make these proteins. But uh, there's a huge variety of functions, right? So everything in your body is essentially running because of proteins. So they're catalysts, what we call enzymes. They are um, synthesizing things. They are metabolizing things, right? So they have a huge variety of functions. And all of these functions are basically due to the fact, this variety of functions are due to the fact that they have very, very specific three-dimensional folded structures. So from the sequence of amino acids, right, the structure that a protein basically folds into, right, that is what is the protein folding problem, right? And predicting that structure, predicting the three-dimensional structure of a protein or designing a sequence of amino acids such that it folds in a particular way is basically what this entire prize and the entire problem is basically about. Can you explain this with an example, if possible, Ahana? Yeah, so if you're thinking about, uh, I mean, the most common example that we know about proteins that we all learn in school, right? Proteins as enzymes or catalysts, right? Um, some, I mean, as some of you may have studied in school, uh, the, you know, the model that we talk about in terms of a, pro a protein or an enzyme fitting a substrate that it acts on, right? The substrate being a smaller molecule, the protein being the large molecule, right? So um, we talk about the lock and key model often. So that means the protein is like a lock and the substrate is like a key that basically fits exactly into that uh, key-shaped active site on the protein. Right? So this active site is very critical and the structure of the active site is what basically makes a protein very, very specific right, to its function and also very selective to its substrate. So if you think about uh, the example of uh, steroids, right? steroids are a class of molecules that are remarkably similar in structure. Uh, they all have um, 17 carbon atoms in four rings. And if you think the, you know, very famous testosterone, right, the male hormone that you have in your body versus the female hormone, which is estradiol, obviously we know that the two hormones, they act very, very differently, right? But they are remarkably similar in structure. And um, they are able to act differently even though they are so similar in structure, because the proteins that they fit into have very specific active sites that only interact with these molecules through certain non-covalent interactions in a very specific way, right? And without that three-dimensional cavity being formed or the active site being formed, without that very precise geometry of the active site, the protein would not be specific or selective. So that's why understanding how a protein folds into a three-dimensional structure and forms a particular kind of cavity or active site is extremely critical. I want to take us to something you briefly touched upon, which yeah. is protein structure prediction. And I have heard of this being described as one of the biggest problems in uh, biochemistry today. So can you 
just sort of flesh it out for me. What exactly is this problem? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's not a new problem. It's uh, something that, you know, dates back to maybe the 1950s or 1970s, right? So it, it kind of, I mean, you can think about it, it's starting from the 1950s. And in fact, the 1972 Nobel Prize was given uh, related to this problem, which was that there was a scientist called uh, Christian Anfinsen, right, who uh, showed for the first time that if you unfolded a protein, right, uh, down, like, you know, make it into the strand of the amino acid sequence, unfold it from its three-dimensional structure and allowed it to fold back, it folded back exactly in the same way, okay? So from that, I think people understood that uh, whatever information you needed, right, to fold a protein in a particular way, whatever information the protein needed was basically contained within that amino acid sequence, right? So the amino acid sequence was like a code, right? And around the same, same time, another scientist working in MIT, um, Cyrus Leventhal, right? He also showed that basically um, for a protein to fold, it folds in a matter of seconds, right? But the number of configurations, the different number of uh, chemical configurations that it actually has to sample would take it a much, much longer time. So that means a protein, when it folds, it is folding according to a certain language or a certain code which is encoded within the amino acid sequence, and it's not really randomly falling into one particular shape, right? So decoding that language, right, how an amino acid sequence dictates how the 3D structure uh, folds, mm -hmm. right, was basically an effort that scientists have been making for a very, very long time. And as computational tools have become more and more advanced mm -hmm. since the 1990s, right, uh, scientists have become better and better at doing it, okay? So around, uh, say, the mid-1990s, mm -hmm. right, there actually started a uh, World Cup of protein structure prediction, okay. right? So now if you look at how things were performing in that World Cup, right, uh, the World Cup basically assigns a score, called the global distance test, right? And the global distance test basically measures the difference in a difference between the protein's actual structure and a predicted structure and then assigns a score. Right? So most things were kind of hovering at around 30 to 40 percent accuracy. And then the people who won the Nobel Prize, right? These guys came around and they managed to achieve at that time, uh, which is um if I remember correctly, 2018, mm -hmm. they managed to achieve a score of around 2000, uh, of around 60%. Right. Okay. So now we consider that, you know, we have the tools and it's become better since then. Right. Yeah. Uh, now the current uh, alpha fold two mm -hmm. has about 90% accuracy, right? Even for very, very difficult to predict structures. So now we consider the protein structure problem as being largely you know, solved, right, the protein folding problem. And we think that, you know, as experimental data becomes better and better, right. the predictions will get even better. Right, right. So let's talk about alpha fold. Uh, alpha fold 2, I think, was the discovery yeah. that John Jumper and Demis Hazipas yeah. uh, are sharing a Nobel Prize for. What is alpha fold 2 and what is the kind of impact that it's actually had? Yeah, so as I said, um, alpha fold Two uh, basically has, you know, about 90% accuracy in uh, what we consider very difficult to predict structures. So there are, of course, some structures that are easier to predict. And so uh, it's really interesting, uh, actually, how they arrived at the uh, algorithm, the machine learning algorithm. So I think everybody knows that, I mean, with the Nobel Prize announcement and all that, this is based on AI and machine learning, right? That has been in the headlines. So essentially, um, before alpha fold one, right, as I said, uh, protein structure prediction was hovering at a score of around 30 per 40 percent. OK, alpha fold one came around and basically uh, shocked the world because their score was at 60 percent. OK, and how they did that was basically 
using the same kind of uh, machine learning algorithm uh, or the same kind of training that any image analysis software has. So now if you take a picture with your phone, right, um, your phone is able to frame a rectangle around your face, right? It's able to recognize your face. All of this is basically image analysis, right, that the phone is doing using artificial intelligence and machine learning. So they used a similar kind of algorithm and um, they managed to achieve an accuracy of about 60%. Mm -hmm. Now, what AlphaFold 2 did on top of that was to basically incorporate, apart from this image analysis kind of algorithm that DeepMind already had, right, to incorporate um, the principles of protein structure, right? So the principles that we got from chemistry, biology, physics, geometry, even mathematics, what we already knew in the scientific world about protein structure, they layered on top of this image analysis algorithm, okay? And that is what actually really, really managed to get this very, very high accuracy. And now, uh, you know, based on what they published in 2021, they've basically predicted the structure of, I think, every protein in the human body, right? So uh, it was, uh, now they're planning to actually release AlphaFold 3, right? I think maybe this year or next year, which will um, predict structures of complexes that proteins form with other biomolecules, right? So like a protein complex with a nucleic acid, for example. Can you quickly just tell me what, what do we really have to benefit if we are able to uh, predict all these structures? What, I mean, why are we so desperate to do so? Um, yeah, I, I think uh, one is to understand how a protein functions, right? Um, to be able, see, firstly, it is a very good tool um, that supplements the arsenal of an experimentalist, right? I'm an experimentalist, so I think from the point of view, an exper experimentalist. So um, determining a protein structure, right? A three-dimensional protein structure, it requires time. Okay, so you have to crystallize a protein, right? And then you, that uh, protein crystallization is not always so easy for all proteins, mm -hmm. right? Or now you have more advances where you can determine a protein structure using solution NMR, right? That's another technique, mm -hmm. right? Where the protein is still, it's not in the crystal state, mm -hmm. like you have to, you had in X-ray crystal diffraction, mm -hmm. but you have it in the solution state. Um, the solution, but it's still, uh, you have to isolate it, purify it, right? And for rarer proteins, it takes more time. So, but then if you're able to kind of uh, predict a protein structure, then you have, a, a, let's say, a smaller subset of structures to kind of search through. That's one thing, right? So experimentally, it supplements experiments and it's uh, helpful to experimentalists. The second thing is that, um, um, understanding the, so the, you know, the example that I used of the active site, um, understanding the structure of the active site using the 3D folded structure of a protein very quickly helps us to design, say, for instance, a drug quickly, right? So if you take the example of, say, a regular chemotherapy drug, right, or a drug, an antibiotic that, you know, combats something in a bacteria, right, combats the growth of a bacteria, you are very often trying to interfere with the function of a protein, right? So for instance, in cancer, you're trying to interfere with the proteins that are responsible or the enzymes that are responsible for DNA replication, which allows the cancer cell to divide, right? Or with bacterial growth, again, you're trying to interfere with some protein that is essential to the functioning of the bacteria, right? In all these cases, if we can accelerate the structure determination of the protein using um, these tools, right. then we are able to design an effective molecule to go and block this. Right. So that's a great segue to uh, David Baker's work, which is in computational protein design. Yeah. Is that what this is about? Can you tell us? Uh, so it's slightly different in the sense what I was talking about previously is basically designing smaller molecules that interfere with an existing protein. But what David Baker has achieved is basically uh, something that is another level, which is given, suppose, um, 
I want a protein to have a particular three-dimensional structure because I want it for any application. I want it to act as a catalyst in a particular way or I want it to be uh, uh, an antibody like, you know, the proteins that are there in your immune system. I want it to be an antibody to a particular kind of antigen, like a particular kind of disease causing thing, right? If I want a protein to fo to have a particular structure, then the reverse thing, what amino acid sequence do I start with? Okay, so protein structure prediction is about going from the amino acid sequence to the fo folded structure. What is the uh, rule, the code that takes us there? And David Baker's work is basically the reverse. If I want a particular 3D structure, then how do I get to the uh, am what amino acid sequence do I start with? And that is what he basically has done. He also uses computational tools. He also uses machine learning based tools to do this. Uh, I want to understand, Anna, at least your perspective of how far has artificial intelligence really penetrated chemistry? Has it, is it really impacting the field in a serious way? Uh, yeah, it is. It is um, accelerating uh, discoveries uh, in many, many different aspects of chemistry, right? So one of uh, the very important aspects is, for instance, um, dealing with uh, uh, drug-resistant microorganisms, okay? So we have, uh, because of the overuse of antibiotics in the world in general, especially in India, in fact, uh, you have all these multi-drug resistant strains of bacteria or pathogens that, you know, are emerging. And what uh, re some recent public published work has enabled is basically quickly predicting drug candidates, which usually takes very long to screen in a traditional laboratory setting, mm -hmm. but quickly predicting drug candidates that are able to fight particular kind of diseases really, really uh, fast, right? Or you have other examples of, say, accelerating the discovery of a catalyst, mm -hmm. right? We know that there's some sorts of material design principles that go into uh, making catalysts for certain functions, right? Uh, but putting it all together and predicting a particular catalyst is also something that machine learning is in. Yeah. And perhaps the last example is something that is... Uh, like basically in my field, mm -hmm. which is uh, predictive toxicology, mm -hmm. where, you know, um, so far when you're trying to test for the toxicity of a substance, right, or a drug, right, before you allow the drug to go for clinical trial or, you know, whatever, when you're trying to test the toxicity of a substance, we've always relied on animal models, right? And now there's a whole effort uh, using artificial intelligence to actually... Um, remove the need perhaps for these animal models, right? So can we actually make predictions of toxicology or side effects of drugs and things like that without using an animal or a, uh, some organism and instead uh, do it using artificial intelligence uh, algorithms and machine learning algorithms? Great. Thank you so much, Ahana, for helping us break down this what could have been a complicated topic, but I think you did a great job at explaining it. If you enjoyed this explainer on the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, make sure you check out the explainers of the Physics Prize and also the Medicine Prize. And you can find all of these and more on Azim Premji University's website and also their YouTube page. Thank you for watching. <laughs>